I'm delighted to be here. This is one of my favorite places on Earth. And I want to talk about how Bits meets Atoms. These are among the biggest computers in the world, things IBM makes. Uh, and one of their main jobs is they're used to model nature. Um, this is what's in them, or what was in them, and they're full of nature. But the whole enterprise of hardware and software serves to try to keep the hardware and software apart. The goal is so programs, programmers don't know about what's going on in the box. That's breaking. It's sort of like the matrix, where there's cracks coming in. Uh, big systems are heading towards uh, tens of megawatts to power them, the power of a city, billions of dollars to buy them. You could buy a city for the machine. We, we, um, more and more problems with programming, huge numbers of cores, interconnect bottlenecks. These are all sort of cracks in the matrix where we're maintaining the fiction that software lives in a virtual world, hardware is in a physical world, but some poor person has to try to get them to talk to each other. We just can't keep doing that. Now, there's an independent lineage. Well, if you step back, um, projecting exascale, we're heading towards, say, 10 to the 20 ops. The universe does 10 to the 120 ops. There isn't a word for that. But we have 10 to the 100 headroom between where we are today and what the universe does. <laughs> There's a lot of space in 10 to the 100 that we're just not using. So why aren't we using that, that extra bit of 10 to the 100? Well, I blame two people. I blame him. <laughs> and he did something that was really problematical. He gave us a model of computing where the head is separate from the tape. But that's not how the universe works. Data and inter state and interaction are part of the same thing. State and interaction aren't different things. And then I also blame him. He, he took that model, gave us our architecture we really live with today, and it was based around these organs that process for you know, control and arithmetic and memory. And it's sort of biologically inspired, but it's a very naive version of biology. As you heard earlier today, biology is full of information down to the proteins. At many different scales, information is embedded. It's not coarse-grained in these organs. So this is how we compute today. But this doesn't come from laws of nature. It really comes from this pile of stuff. <laughs> the, the seminal report that gave us von Neumann's architecture was how do you make that pile of stuff work? And essentially, at heart, all the computers in this room are a sort of a technological history of that thing that we're still carrying around. It's not fundamental. So how do we tap the rest of the universe? There's an independent lineage that IBM has really nursed and has done seminal work on. I think the father of it is Rolf Landauer, who taught us information is physical and asked, what are the theoretical limits on computation independent of physics, and really did seminal work towards that, although, um, the one catch was, Rolf was quite firm that this was theory, it wasn't architecture. I had a lunch with him pounding the table in the cafeteria where he said, don't try to build computers this way, it's just theory. Um, luckily, Charlie Bennett, if he's listening on the video, uh, didn't listen, and Charlie took it seriously and asked, how do you make computers based on what Rolf taught us? And Charlie, in turn, did this beautiful work um, that helped create the notion computers can operate reversibly, so the amount of power is limited just simply by how certain you want to have an answer how quickly. Um, uh, he introduced the idea of how you could compute with molecules, do fundamentally molecular computation, really took seriously how do you build computers that work this way. So um, around that time, I started hanging out here, and a really visionary manager who doesn't get a as much credit as she, he should, Nabil Amir, put together a group of interesting people to talk about, essentially, how do we capture the 10 to the 100 that we're missing. And so I, I want to talk a little bit about what radiated out from those meetings. And I'm not sure everybody at IBM even realizes what came from it, and then start to project forward to the future. So uh, this group ran some uh, workshops in emerging areas. One was device physics of user interfaces, new ways to physically interact uh, with, with computing that led to all kinds of new uh, user interfaces. Um, one project looked at, instead of uh, communicating, then computing, what if you embedded computation into the communication? And then showed you can make entirely new ways to communicate based on computing. 
And that grew into an entirely new kind of chip design. In, in integrated circuits, there's digital logic, like you use in a computer. Then there's analog circuits, like you use in a radio front end. What came out of this, a couple steps down, was what's called analog logic, which isn't analog or digital. It's solving digital problems with analog devices, but it's solving a digital problem. And so the idea is, a computer is a hypercube. Each bit is zero or one. So you take all those axes of zeros and ones, and that's the space a computer is. Here you solve a digital problem in the same space, but the analog devices let you go into the interior. And going into the interior lets you take shortcuts that save power, and it lets you represent probabilistic information that's not certain, even though it's digital. So it's solving a digital problem with analog degrees of freedom. So the student that then worked with me on that spun off Lyric Semiconductor that was just bought by Analog Devices. They're doing a lot of beautiful stuff where you can think about it as like an A to D, instead of digitizing a voltage, digitizes a code. You get answers at the end, not the beginning, using all the information in the system. So an entirely new kind of chip design came from those meetings. Uh, another thing that came from them was uh, work on mesoscopics, which is coherent scattering and disordered media led to looking at the implications for detecting tampering. That led to the development of physical one-way functions, which are cryptosystems made by light scattering, but the cryptosystem does a hash function, a cryptographically secure hash function, but it's hashing a terabit of data in a penny's worth of material, so you can make materials-based uh, security that's beyond national technical means to forge. Uh, another thing that came out from that was some of the early work David, Charlie, others did on the creating quantum computing. Uh, a wonderful time when it wasn't clear what it was good for and you had to be sort of a strange person to work on it. And it led to inventing quantum computing. In turn, this group inspired work that did the first implementations of um, non-trivial algorithms, initially using nuclear spin dynamics of uh, uh, searching faster than you can do linearly and then uh, leading up to Ike's implementation of factoring. Uh, those techniques have lived on. We developed for those experiments and many other experimental system. What's less known is we had to improve the sensitivity of spin detection that led to the invention of micro-slot spin probes, if, if you're interested, I can tell you more, that turned out to be the most integra sensitive, integrated way to do multidimensional molecular structural studies. So for ultra-small sample um, studies, instead of spending a year amplifying a protein, or for analyzing molecules at biologically meaningful concentrations rather than saturating, this ended up being the winning way to do that. And it was an offshoot of trying to make better quantum computers. So those are just three vignettes of what had been a kind of an abstract theoretical exercise of alternatives for computing and businesses and patents and really research fields that radiated out from them. And the final thing that came out from it for me is what I do for a living, which is now the CBA program. There is a group of people like me, physicists, chemists, biologists, who just the whole notion between computer science and physical science never made sense. I, I, I consider computer science one of the worst things ever to happen to computers or to science. <laughs> Be, because it, was, it segregated it. It said computer science is somehow different from nature. And in fact, for people like me, it's really the same thing. And so CBA is a range of disciplines but, but that live at that boundary. And so what I'd like to do now is tell you what is emerging for literally, if you just look at how digital and physical relate going forward. So one of the first things we did, uh, this is a paper I wrote with Danny Cohen, uh, another interesting person not enough people know. He's now at Oracle, he was a Sun Fellow. Before that, he started the Moses Chip Fab many people use but don't realize it's from Danny. And before that, he's the one who separated what became TCP from what became IP. Um, TCP and IP were the same thing. Uh, he said, no, routing is different from flow control, so we should call them different things. So one of the early internet architects, and we wrote this paper, I think this was the beginning of the phrase Internet of Things, looking at what does it mean to bring internet architecture into physical things. And one of the lessons we learned is the internet is based on inner networking, so you don't need to worry about whose kind of network it is, and the state lives at the edges of the network. 
Um, to do it in, in these embedded systems, the overhead of plugging into hubs and doing MIMO antennas is too great. So you need to inner network not at layer three in the protocol, but at layer one in the physics. And we de develop ways to do inner networking through physics, even though it's native IP compatible. And that grew into work with Cisco and Schneider and a number of companies like that in large scale test beds. Um, killer apps that emerged include healthcare and energy was a huge one, as you heard earlier. What we found from starting to deploy these is buildings use three quarters of the electricity, a third is wasted. But the third wasted um, largely isn't inefficiency, it's, it's pathology, it's stupidity. It turns out buildings are disasters. They're full of like heaters running the same time coolers go, fans that go backwards. They're just basket cases of just not inefficiency, deficiency. But the connection to Internet of Things is the people who live in the rooms know it, the people who repair them know it, but you can't do it. The, 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 the state is centralized. The barrier to entry to add a sensor is $1,000 to wire it in and change the control system. The users can't change the system. So for me, Internet of Things and Smart Grid have become very bad words. They're almost consistently used with exactly the inverted meeting where Internet of Things means a mainframe somewhere is connected to a sensor. Smart grid means a central computer controls a dumb appliance. It's exactly BitNet versus the Internet, or central office phone switches uh, versus uh, VOIP. Internet of, the principles of the Internet are it's incrementally extensible. You add to it at the edges. And the applications live at the edges, and so what the network does is defined by what you connect to it, not what it's connected to. If you go back and look at much of the use of those words, it means exactly, precisely the opposite of what Internet architecture is. So we know how to do IP for a dollar to any device over any physical media. That's how you recover this energy. But you, we don't need to fight BitNet versus the Internet again. We need to recognize you need to use these sort of techniques to push the Internet in order of magnitude deeper into physical infrastructure. That's the first step in. Second step in, if we're going to fill the world with computing, how do we program it? So today you write source code, it becomes object code, it becomes an executable, it runs in a processor. Those representations just, they look different. They have nothing to do with each other. Uh, now think about, uh, this is the building I work in, then you zoom out and that's the town I work in, that's its city, the state, the country, the world. When you zoom a map, you don't morph it. You don't kind of arbitrarily change the geometry of the map when you zoom out. But that's what we do with software. Why do you change the representation when you zoom software when reality doesn't work that way? So we had set out to ask, how do you compute so it looks more like zooming a map? So, you, so software to hardware isn't a boundary. It looks the same wherever you look at it. Seed for that, this was a wonderful PhD. Um, Minsky and Fredkin were the thesis committee. Banks in the 70s showed just as a theoretical problem, a cellular automata, like the game of life, is computationally universal. So you have these little one-bit cells. They have just three rules. And so that becomes data. That's a, a corner. That's a gate. And he showed you can do Boolean logic in a CA. So a CA can compute anything. And that was just a theoretical problem. Uh, going forward, a little bit related, this may be my favorite computer IBM ever made, for people who date back to that. Um, th this was an APL machine, and APL is this beautiful language that there are lines, but not really. It's not lines of code. You, you have these shapes, and information flows through the shapes, and that's how my brain works. It's not how computer scientists' brain works, and so you know, it's sort of languished, but this machine was made to compute that way. Um, uh, with people like Charlie, Norman Tom made these wonderful CA machines that just simply memory in a lookup table uh, projecting forward. And the current version of that is this. Um, this is logic automata. It's a model of computing where there are cells, and each cell is cartoon physics. So cells pass tokens, and a token is a value. And a cell waits for tokens valid coming in, no tokens coming out. When that happens, it pulls the input and pushes the output. Um, and so what that means is in that world, the distance a token travels equals the time it takes to travel, equals the number of operations you can perform, equals the amount of information you can store. So memory, processing, interconnect aren't different things. They're all properties of the medium, which is in fact how reality works. 
Um, so there's cells that do logic on tokens, that transport them, that create and destroy them and switch them. And so with that now, here's an example of an implementation of scientific libraries. This is just one part. This is a dot product operation. So here's the dot product. The blinking you see are the tokens. Then it'll fly through. So as you fly in, there's a multiplier. And then multipliers are made from adders. And then adders are made from cells. And eventually, you get to see the tokens. So it's programmed in a way that's hierarchical and modular. But this is now like the map zoom. It's a hierarchical modular programming environment, but you fly through it like you do a map. All levels of description respect the constraints underneath. And so the reason we're so excited about that is because the program reflects nature, the hardware scales in the same way as the software. They can't not scale the same way. So we've implemented this in uh, multi-core clusters. We've implemented in seas of commodity processors. Um, Custom Silicon looked at novel physics. But one of the things we really like is they all run the same program, unchanged, because we assume nothing about architecture. All we ask is that the cells pass these tokens. And if you have a technology that passes the tokens locally, it works the same globally. Um, they don't need power to do nothing. Power is only taken when there's a token to do something. And in CMOS, it takes about a tenth of a picojoule to move a token, which is about the same as a DRAM refresh. Um, the only design rules are in the cells, so you get this great scalability. Um, you can verify because there's no change of representation. So what you did at a top level you know works at the low level. If you want, you can tape out a chip directly from a program just by mapping the cells. It has all these nice properties. It turns out sort of Peace, Turing, and von Neumann, it's easier to program this way. You don't need to worry about how you schedule threads or X manage a memory. Um, th they're all answered by the physics. It, we haven't removed challenges in programming, but a lot of the hard things in programming come from these band-aids to work around the fact that it really is physics underneath. It's easier just to do it from the start. And so there's a lively discussion with colleagues at IBM on implementation. So where this leaves us, not soon, but further out, is today to buy a system, you pick a processor, you pick uh, L2 cache, you pick interconnect, you, know, all, you pick an instruction set, all those decisions. Uh, these are what the systems we make look like. And where this is heading is this is how you'll buy computing. You'll pick pounds or you'll pick square feet. And when you need more, you get more pounds or you get more square feet. The computing becomes a bulk raw material. And, and the reason why it really looks like we're heading towards that is anything other than that is a fiction. If you compute on a hypercube, it's great, but at some point, it's just not going to scale. The only thing that scales is nature. When I use twice as much nature, it runs at the same speed. Nature is scalable. So in the end, the model of computation has to scale with nature. So th this isn't in foreseeable generations, but further out, we're looking at computing just simply becoming a bulk raw material in this way and finding it's actually easier to make and easier to program. So second step in. Uh, step after that, once computing becomes a spatial structure, a program is a shape, it means you can also overlay it with physical reality. So we have a DARPA program where this was the statement of work and deliverables. <laughs> um, and you, you may laugh, but they didn't and we don't. That actually is what we have to do. We're trying to make flying carpets. And the connection between distributed computing and flying carpets is if you take spatial computing, and then each of the cells has one extra thing, which is actuators that can either move shear or normal flow. It means you can program boundary layer flows. And once you can program boundary layer flows, today when you make an engine, a turbine spins that pushes on a pylon, that pushes on a wing, that then pushes air down, that then pushes up on a wing box, that then pushes on a fuselage. You don't really have to do all those steps. It, with distributed computing meets distributed actuation, you make little cells that each does one of all of those. And the, 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 the um, lift, propulsion, all become distributed properties. And what we're finding is when you do that, there's a 
really interesting wins in the aerodynamic efficiency. It ends up being much more efficient aerodynamically to do it this way. It ends up being scalable, like UAVs become roll to roll. You just sort of snip off as much UAV as you need for a mission. <laughs> And um, we're looking at um, wind generation applications where instead of an insane turbine, you just have sheets of the stuff as a continuum wind generator. So there's a very interesting connection between spatial computing and spatial applications, like in this case, boundary layer flows. Then once computation can move things, it means it can change shape. So another program we have has the relatively modest goal of creating life, but not in organic chemistry, we're going to do it in inorganic systems because we want to do it on length scales and energy scales that organic chemistry can't do. So the heart of fabrication in life is the ribosome. The ribosome is my favorite protein. It reads a 1D code in a messenger RNA. It brings in um, amino acids and tRNAs and assembles amino acids like micro Lego and folds a protein. That builds the molecular machinery. Um, unlike synthetic chemist, organic chemistry that can have like a part in 100 error rate. Uh, the ribosome has about a 10 to the 4 error rate, adding extra error correction. Uh, DNA replication is a part in 10 to the 8 because it's a fundamentally digital system. So this project is based on protein folding, but, but in systems we engineer. So the first part was developing a workflow. Solving what shape a protein makes is hard. This is the opposite. It's figuring out how to make a shape a string make a shape you want. So it turns out, done wrong, this is computationally intractable, but there's a simple trick that makes it easy to do. You start with a 3D shape, it turns it into a 1D code, and then the 1D code becomes the 3D shape. So that lets us turn shapes into codes, where the code doesn't describe sort of the steps to make it, the code is it. And then we've implemented that over nine orders of magnitude, versions from assembling proteins to nanoclusters to microfluidics to microrobotics to conventional robotics. This is a segment of a robot that can be any shape. It's a robot that works like a protein, so it can turn into whatever shape you want, uh, to scary room-sized versions that are big, big things that can change shape. Um, and these all have the property that they're continuous 1D chains. Um, they all run the same folding code. Um, but now you can do them on energy and length scales biology can't reach. So the key insight behind that project isn't new. Y you're the existence proof. This is how the ribosome works, but we're coming to appreciate we can make things that way. And so stepping out, phones were analog. Claude Shannon wrote the most influential master's thesis anybody's ever done at MIT on Boolean logic. He went to the phone company with this idea of threshold theorems. A threshold theorem shows if you add information and remove it, there's a threshold, and if the noise is below the threshold, the error rate goes down exponentially. And it means you can communicate perfectly with imperfect devices. Uh, there was still enough Bell Labs old timers there when I got to Bell Labs to tell me the stories that when he got there, nobody really believed it or took it seriously. There's about 10 years of the analog camp versus the digital camp for the phone system. And what finally settled the battle was death. <laughs> Just the analog managers died. <laughs> the um, the you know, digital managers took over, then they got to do it. So it's a lesson about organizational change. And, um, and so we have the internet. And you wouldn't use an analog telephone call to talk to China. Uh, this, were this is Vannevar Bush's last great analog computer at MIT. It's a room full of gears and pulleys. And the longer you ran it, the worse the answer was. Um, uh, a bigger group, von Neumann, Winograd, Cowan, digitized computing. You view a computation as a communication sort of through the system, and then they showed threshold theorems that showed you can compute reliably with unreliable devices, and you now have what was a supercomputer in your pocket. But uh, at MIT in 1950, the first computer was connected to a milling machine. Um, this was an offshoot from Project Whirlwind, this is essentially an air defense computer connected to a milling machine, and it was to make Air Force parts they were having trouble making. Since then, nothing's really changed. Um, you might go from subtractive machining to additive printing, and you might make, in fact, integrated circuits, but there's no information in the materials. All the information is external to the system. When you mill, you whack it metal. When you 3D print, you squirt plastic. The basic process used in a chip fab, a village artisan would understand. You spread stuff around and you bake it. 
The information is not in the materials. The lesson to take from what I described in digital fabrication, the essence of molecular biology, is digitizing fabrication doesn't mean a computer is connected to a tool. It means the computer is a tool. It doesn't mean a program describes a thing. It means a program is a thing. The information is in the materials, not external to the system. That may sound abstract or semantic, but it's precisely the same story of going from an analog to a digital telephone call. The, the symbols are discrete. Precisely the same story of going from an analog to a digital computation. And so the conclusion we're coming to is we're just at the edge of this very interesting transition of a digital revolution in fabrication. It's not a 1950 mainframe to a computer. It's information in materials, precisely replaying the script of von Neumann, uh, Turing et al., to, to digitize fabrication. So we're getting there in four stages. One is computers connected to machines. The step after that is machines making machines, machines that make their own parts. And we're there now. What's in the lab today is going from machines making machines, but either cutting or squirting, to machines with digital materials. So from microelectronics to aerospace, we're making machines that assemble like Lego. If you think of a lump of clay versus Lego, um, playing with Lego, or like that milling machine, playing with Lego, you don't need a ruler. The parts induce the coordinate system. Um, you can error correct. The bricks either snap or don't. So it means a child playing with Lego makes a structure more accurate than their motor control. And then when you're done, you don't put Lego in the trash. You, you disassemble the parts and reuse them. None of those apply to manufacturing. All apply to molecular biology. At this stage, which commercially is maybe five years away, we're making assemblers of micro Lego. And what's so interesting about this stage is this is when trash goes away. Technical trash reflects there's no information in the materials to tell you what to do with them. Uh, again, you don't, you don't throw away Lego. You reuse the parts because they're distinguishable and discrete. And so here we're making high throughput assemblers and disassemblers. And that's maybe five years away. And the 20 year away stage is what I showed you about actually putting the programs and materials. That's when you lose the machines and the materials themselves configure. Now line that up historically. Uh, the, main, the milling machine connected to the mainframe dates from the mainframe era. Uh, then, this is one of my favorite pictures. It's Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie inventing Unix. This is that magical moment when computers went from a thing a corporation would use to a work group. And so they could have a vision of what computing could be and not have to get approval from their management. So just about everything you do with a computer today happened then. Uh, you know, email, word processing, all of that really developed in that era. Now, for PDP users in the room, to say computer is sort of charitable. There's a processor rack and an I.O. rack and a memory and tapes and all kinds of cables. It wasn't easy to use, but a work group could do it. And that's analogous to field labs I'm going to tell you about. Then what after, came after that were the Altair computers. And so for those whose lives were transformed by that, when it first arrived, the killer app was you flip switches on the panel to load a binary program, and then you run it, and the lights blink. Life-changing experience <laughs> for me and a number of people. And so the machines that make machines are like the Altair generation. And then we finally get back to the, P get to the PC and everything that radiated from IBM's PC. And that's when we get to the Star Trek replicator. Now, the lesson you should take from this slide is uh, exponentials. Starting here is when Moore's Law began. And the number of nodes in the internet, the speed of the processor, all of that was doubling. So by the time down here you noticed it, we had been, been many generations into the doubling. And business models, applications, all of that was happening here. You didn't have to wait down here to start to ask, what are the implications and how do you use computing? And so I'm not telling you a story about the future. This is a bold prediction about the present. We're now about five years into the doubling on this side of the digital fabrication for speed and size and all of that. It's exactly recreating that history, but now digitizing reality. So in turn, that's the research. We didn't think too much about why do it, who cares, just because the content was interesting. But um, partway through that, uh, a mandate was passed. NSF had to prove social impact. NSF gave us a lot of money. CBA started when we said we wanted a tool to make anything on any scale, and NSF surprised us by agreeing. 
So um, NSF had to show social impact to Congress. They said, show social impact. We didn't know what to do. And it just didn't sound like much fun to make a website or a class. So we thought we'd give people the tools rather than tell them about them. And what grew from it was an accident. In search of solutions for the world we share, principal voices in association with Shell. We've had a digital revolution, but we don't need to keep having it. We can declare success, we won. What's coming now is the digital revolution in fabrication. My colleagues and I started teaching a class called How to Make Almost Anything. And the idea was just that. It's a program looking at how the digital world relates to the physical world. And one of the core things coming out of the research is the idea of digital fabrication, making the Star Trek replicator, an assembler that makes anything you want by building the atoms on up. This is designed where you put in the ribbon. Millions of dollars of equipment at MIT are like the mainframes of digital fabrication. We can make anything we want using those tools. In 20 years, we'll make it so you can have it in the home. The fab labs are in between. They spread all around the world, letting ordinary people create technology from South Africa to the north of Norway and from rural India to inner city Boston. Instead of spending vast amounts of money to send computers and energy and communication around the world, you can spend much less to send the means to create it. Energy, communication, computation, just to say the words, they sound big. They're being tackled as billion dollar mega projects top down. Fab Labs is tackling them from the bottom up. We're just finding so many people with such interesting inventions and such great ideas. Sharing that is where I see this going. So that was shot a few hours above the Arctic Circle, as far north as you can go in Norway, where satellite dishes look at the ground, not the sky, because that's where the satellites are. And these labs have been doubling every year. There's about 100 now, um, North Africa, n North Norway, South Africa, rural India. And we didn't plan any of that but there was this viral spread of not a digital divide on a computer screen, but a digital divide bringing computing out into the world where people are to measure and modify things. So the seed for me as I started that class, How to Make Anything, which was supposed to be for research, but was swamped with people who wanted to make stuff. And they did the most inventive things. A student made a device that saves up screams and plays it back later when it's convenient. One made a dress that defends your personal space if somebody comes close. And one made an alarm clock you wrestle with and prove that you're awake. And just, they happened so consistently that I learned that the killer app for digital fabrication is personal fabrication. Remember Ken Olson famously saying, nobody needs computers in the home. Deck is bankrupt twice over and you have computers in the home, but they're not there for inventory and payroll. They're there for things you want. And so the point of digital fabrication isn't to make what you can buy at Walmart, it's to make what you can't buy in Walmart. It's technology for one individual and that touches this very deep thing. And so these labs spread, you know, this is in Western Maharashtra, this is the coast of Ghana, this is a township in South Africa, this is Eastern Afghanistan. You just don't wake up in Cambridge, Mass and think, you, Afghanistan, Eastern Afghanistan needs precision fab tools. But every time we open these, somebody else wants one. There's one of these labs in Barcelona picking up where Gaudi left off. Um, uh, most people don't realize this. Gaudi, if you look at Sagrida Familia, it's clear Gaudi didn't outsource his civil engineering. He did these beautiful things, hanging catenary chains to figure out how to make the structures. So they picked up where he left off, and they recently won the People's Choice in the European Solar Decathlon, where they used their fab lab to do rapid prototyping um, at scale of a solar house. Um, so they uh, assembled, uh, like you make a toy house, a full-size house, and interestingly, in the decathlon, there were nine solar houses made conventionally that were rectangular boxes. And then there was just this one gorgeous one designed to maximize solar capture, and they made all the furniture inside. Um, they won the people's choice. They didn't want the performance contest because everybody wanted to be in this one, and so they had this big heat load from all the uh, people in it. Um, then uh, this was a project where um, we had set up one of these labs in Afghanistan. Now, a story about MIT students who helped build a wireless network in Jalalabad, Afghanistan, out of junk. They call it Fab Phi. That's a mix of Wi-Fi and Fab Lab. Students at MIT's Center for Bits and Atoms have created fabrication laboratories, or Fab Labs, across the globe. Fab Labs are like community centers with machinery and computers that the public can use to create things. 
The goal is for the community to use and develop technology that addresses their specific needs. And here to talk with us about the Fab Five project in Afghanistan is MIT graduate student Amy Sun. Welcome to the program. Thanks, Robert. And so she and goes on to explain there was lots of aid coming in that wasn't useful. One of the biggest needs was information and connectivity. So they used the Fab Lab to make a citywide internet, making radios and high gain antennas, then locally caching things like open courseware and Wikipedia, you know, with these epiphanies of I didn't know that and community connectivity, but not done with a telco coming in or as an aid project, but done bottom up as a community project. And in fact, the same project is now running on a sustainable commercial basis in uh, Kenya. Um, then we had this problem of amazing kids would come through these labs, learn these skills, and fall off a cliff in dysfunctional school systems. And so there wasn't a career path for them. The usual answer is you're smart, you have to leave, which defeats the whole reason of doing this. And so rather than ripping them out and bringing them to a place like MIT, which is like MIT sort of a mainframe to process people, or doing distance learning, which is a mainframe with terminals. You connect people to the people processor. What we set up is, is an internet of education, students with peers and work groups in these labs, but then linked by broadband video. And so the whole thing is a campus. And it was very interesting with Educause. We then went to get a .edu for this, and they say, we love it. You have to get accredited. We said, sure. So we talked to the accreditors, and they said, that's fine. We love it. Where are you located? And we said, yes. <laughs> and they said, sorry because accreditation is by law a place. You can't accredit a network, you can only credit a physical space. And they said, we don't know, we can't accredit it, it violates the law. But they said, we love it, so make up a degree, pretend it's real, and eventually we'll catch up to you. <laughs> and it's working. We're teaching a made-up degree using the whole internet, uh, you know, using this whole network of labs as a distributed, not distance learning educational model. Um, Another project in these labs is creating businesses where you go to market by shipping data. Um, an interesting location is at Manchester in the UK. At one point, they had three quarters of the world's mills. This was the Industrial Revolution. Now they have two football teams and just about nothing else. <laughs> and so they're using these labs to look at uh, if anybody can make anything anywhere, it means you go to market not by making a prototype, sending it to Shenzhen, filling a container, and then driving trucks. You go to market by shipping data and then producing on demand locally, but the prototype becomes the product when everything is produced on demand that way. And the lesson from things like inkjet printing is a lot of low rate production done in many places adds up to the throughput of high rate production, but makes more sense if you're not making the same thing. So big factories don't go away. But by definition, they do boring things. They do nuts and bolts. The things that are meaningful are different. The things that reflect who you are, and they get made locally on demand. And then finally, um, these are turning into national infrastructure. Um, the national labs are great resources. They're very expensive. And there's a fairly high barrier to cross the fence and interact with them. Um, uh, uh, this national network of labs is running as sort of a new kind of national lab. This is Obama visiting one um, in Ohio. And that led Bill Foster, a Fermilab physicist in the last Congress, to do very interesting legislation. I'm United States Congressman Bill Foster, and I'm one of the few members of the United States House of Representatives who was a scientist before entering politics. So I often tell people that I represent about one-third of the strategic reserve of physicists in Congress. But when I came into work each day in physics, my first stop often wasn't to my office computer or some meeting, but to the laboratory machine shop to check on the progress of some parts that I designed for an experiment or for part of an accelerator. So I can think that, I believe I can safely say that I'm the only member of the United States Congress that knows how to program numerically controlled machine tools. I'm proud to announce that I recently introduced legislation in the United States House of Representatives which supports the goals and mission of the National Fab Lab Network as in the best interests of our people and the best interests of promoting the goals of greater science and technical education, greater access to research and production tools, and empowerment of individuals to understand and use technology to improve their lives. You can think of the NFLN as a new kind of national lab in the United States that's a cloud laboratory, a national network of connected local labs. I've been lucky to have the chance to visit Neil and see the progenitor of all fab labs myself and to work with the people in my own congressional district in Illinois who are planning to create their own. And I'm proud to count myself among the many supporters of this concept. 
the creation of the National Fab Lab. So it goes on to explain the idea is to create a public-private partnership to run this national network of local labs as a linked new kind of national lab for education, for outreach, for research, for incubation in, in this distributed way. One lab alone isn't a critical mass, but because they data becomes things and things become data, you can do projects distributed across them. Now, sadly, in the last uh, wave election, he was defeated by a Tea Party um, creationist who doesn't believe in evolution, which was kind of hard for a physicist. Um, happily, in the next election, that district was removed um, uh, in the census, and so he's running in that. And there's a number of other supporters um, in Congress and the White House for this, so th th a lot of interest with it. So with that, I'll stop. Oh, oh yeah, no, I won't stop. I'll add stop here by noting everything I said von Neumann and Turing understood. They did what they did to make things work with what they had, and it's had a big impact. It's been a good ride. But both of them ended their life studying computation in spatially distributed systems, looking at computing essentially better aligned with nature. Um, they couldn't make them then. I think we can go back to the future and finally end up with, we can really realize the vision of where they ended their lives and make computation that's aligned with nature. Doing it that way, it's easier to program, it's more energy efficient, it's more scalable, but it leads to very, very different applications of computation where the computing can leave the box and come out here where we live. Uh, fabrication, turning data things, things to data, uh, transporting things, all of those things aren't just conventional computers controlling dumb things. It's, it's at these very fundamental le levels merging bits and atoms. So with that, the, everything is linked off of here, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. I'm Mark Wegman from IBM. Uh, oh, it's not on? Yes, it is on. Um, I think I, uh, thank you for an enjoyable talk. And it's, of course, controversial, so I, uh, I'll, I'll take you up on at least Good. a little of the bait. Um, you argued that your computational model is easier to program. I don't believe that. I believe that it matches the physical world, I believe that it may be more efficient and, and, and faster. I believe that if you are writing programs which model certain physical things, it may be easier to program. But for the vast majority of what people, in fact, do write programs for, I think it's probably significantly harder to program if you keep your model of assuming that things have this the zooming property. So I believe that, for example, you could write a compiler from a better language, uh, and in fact a higher level language than what we normally do, for example, compiling down to an FPGA, which is kind of closer to your model of a physical level, um, that in fact would be easier to program for a large number of tests. So, for example, the typical task that I'm thinking of is while so, we're... If I may, for ahead. time, um, ch challenge is it's, it's maybe harder, not easier to program. So um, in the end, that's hard to quantify. P you know, programmers will vote with their fingers. The, the, the anecdotal answer is we really enjoy it because you're freed from a lot of the baggage of things like thread scheduling. But let me tell you how we program it. Because na naively, you would think this is just good for like you know, lattice fluid modeling. But what we're finding, it really is universal. We, one way we program it was with something that's like a hardware description language. Think of Verilog or VHDL, but the difference is we're, it's more like CAD. Words describe shapes. So when you say the words, you're describing the relationships of shapes. So a lot of the place and route is implicit in the verbal description. The other way we do it, though, is visual data flow. So if you look at all the people who use Simulink and LabVIEW, um, in fact, a lot of the users that drive us, for example, in aerospace, that is how they, they do their programming. Something like um, LabVIEW is modular. You have blocks, and then those go into blocks, and those go into blinger, bigger blocks, and you connect the blocks. The distinction there is the picture on your screen of the graph is how you think about it, how you represent it, but then you go to a schedule and execute it. What we do is we just take the picture and go and run it. Sort of, the picture is directly executable. That's your, that's your programming a simulation of a 
physical thing, which I no, no, not, not physical. What I'm describing is just uh, uh, arbitrary. Oh. So, for example, in that example we did the Let blahs in support. Off. It's uh, it's arbitrary models of computation. Um, let me show you implementations of programs. We've been sur the easy answer is you think it wouldn't be universal. We've been surprised at just how universal it is. One of the themes today, and we've all been on our grand challenge problems, things that are happening in the world. If the matter and the shape is, is the computer, are there ways that it can be designed to sort of accumulate the problems and start to compute? So uh, l let me end with, in thinking about grand challenge, things I talked about lead towards, if we're right, potentially more scalable computers, higher performance computers, more energy efficiency. A out of everything I'm doing, though, I would suggest ignoring all of that. Um, this story of computation meets fabrication uh, is really significant. Manufacturing, if I say it, sort of all the air goes out of the room and now it sounds boring. What we're finding is the digital revolution is over. We won. We don't need to keep fighting it. We have digital computing, digital communication. They'll keep scaling. It's hard. Wizards here will make it happen. I, 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 this research class on digital fabrication was for 10 students. You know, hundreds show up begging to get in in tears, unlike anything I've ever seen. They don't usually do that for a class. We did one outreach project. It's gone viral, doubled every year. It's, it's filled the world. Computation meets fabrication touch, so, touches something really, really, really deep. When I went to... High school, I wanted to go to the vocational school because you weld and fix cars. They said, no, you're smart. You have to sit in a room. <laughs> when I went to Bell Labs, I tried to work in the workshop, and I got grievances. They said, no, you're smart. You have to tell somebody what else to do. And I didn't understand it. It dates back to a mistake in the Renaissance. Art and artisans separated. The liberal arts were the means of expression. Everything else was for commercial gain. We're left with a world where technology is done to us. So I would argue that we need to keep pushing digital communication and computation. They're important for all the things we said, but they've happened. We, we can see the impact. We need to deliver on it. The big grand challenge coming is programming the physical world, and it's not 1950 computers connected to machines. It's putting intelligence in the materials. It means everybody can make everything. And once you do that, it breaks all of the boundaries of academia aid industry. The hardest part in this project isn't the science. I thought that was hard. It's we've had to completely build all the new organizations from scratch because all the incumbents can't go there. So I would end with digital fabrication is the grand challenge. Digitizing reality, getting the bits out of the box into the world changes everything. And, and that's the real story we see coming. Thank you.